Welcome to Rugby is Mental. Every week, Francois Corner and myself, Andre, break down every element of the game that we all like to love and even sometimes hate a little bit. From the scrum downs to the side steps, the science to the psychology, coaching and the couch politics, as well as the money and the mental game. Join us as we share almost 50 years worth of collective experience in coaching, mental coaching, player welfare, and sport business in our weekly guest interviews. Today's special guest is Saracens legend Neil de Kock. Neil played 263 games for the English and European Giants after having spent six seasons with Western Province and the Stormers in Super Rugby, during which time he also added 10 Springbok tests to his belt. He has been called one of the best foreign signings ever to the London-based club due to his commitment, work ethic and character. Today we engage Neil on the magic of organisational culture, caring for players in a team and career transitions from the game. Over to you, Francois. Cool. Okay, Neil, welcome. It's great to have you uh, with us and uh, we look forward to hearing what wisdom and uh, gems you have to share. <laughs> um, about that. Yeah, we, we call this podcast Rugby is Mental. Yeah. yeah before the, obviously the pun in it, for yes. both the brain side of it and the, the craziness of the game. Yeah. So maybe um, we could kick off with a question that I have for you. Um, you haven't played 250 or 63 games? Yeah, yeah, 263, yeah. Jeez, that's massive. Um, and I know the culture and, uh, is a big thing there. So my question for you is, um, the character side of a player, mm. and you, you are coaching now, how do you instill that in young people? How, how do you help young people develop the character that's necessary to play the game? Sure, a nice easy question to yes, start just with. <laughs> <laughs> I was told you're the expert on this. <laughs> no, hardly an expert. Um, I don't know, I suppose there's a, there's a lot of opinion out there on, on how you go about um, instilling the correct character. And I think, depending on what age level you coach at, but you know, if, you, if you're getting a, a player at the age of 18, I think those foundations have already been put in place. You know, and I think it's about honing it. Um, and I think it's about, I suppose, you know, if I take Saracens, for example, it, it was, you know, high level was quite a simple approach. It was get people to work unbelievably hard and treat people unbelievably well. And Venter come in with Edward Griffiths and these guys took the mantle and they led incredibly well at a time where a club was at its probably one of its lowest ebbs, struggling for form, struggling for consistency. And they came in and they preached or rather lived what they preached um, or practiced what they preached. Can, can the you remember some of the things that you as a young player saw and like inspired you and said, okay, I want to be like that? Yeah, I think it was relentlessly positive is, is one of the terms. So wow. we would treat each other really well. We'd be unbelievably positive. We'd rather encourage a person for what they bring and work on what they were lacking instead of highlighting the fact that they were missing certain factors that were being looked for in them. Um, it was about listening, being open, you know, encouraging the guys to, to make mistakes and not fear being lambasted for that. Um, and with the, you know, I think, it, as I said, the timing was great. There's a lot of timing involved in this and the timing was great. The personnel is crucial. So we had the right guys at the right time led by the right people, you know, and eight months later, it might have been a disaster. The way the, the way it was run, but um, you know we, we were we were told work unbelievably hard. Your work ethic is, is the first thing is, that's going to be looked at. Attitude was a deciding factor whether players were actually going to have a career at Saracens or not. And I think if if I take you back, there was a year this watershed moment when there were fourteen players who were who were fired. On the spot, on 14. Monday, 14 players on a Monday morning um, prior to the season ending, six weeks before the season ended. And we still had six weeks to run. I was fortunate enough to be one of the guys still to stay on, but we had six weeks to run in the season with 14 guys who knew that, that to go and look for a job elsewhere. And that was hard. Um, but the deciding factor as to why the decision was made on those 14, and admittedly the coaches then said, and Brendan said that, he obviously made a mistake once with one or two of the players, and it's, it's not a perfect science, but attitude was one of the deciding factors into, do, into him deciding who stayed and who left, because he needed people who were like-minded, people who wanted to be on this 
this train to getting Saracens to, to the levels that they are playing at today. Be spoiling players. Others would view it as player development and focusing on everything outside what makes a function what makes a player function on the field. So for an example, um, Marcelo Bosch is a good example, who played centre for Saracens for quite some time, Argentinian international. He came in um, for his negotiation, so to speak, and he, and he met at a coffee shop. I quite like this story. And him and his wife went to go and meet uh, Brendan Edward and they sat at a coffee shop. And Brendan Edward sat down at the table and they said to Marcelo, Marcelo, please go and buy us some coffees and get some pastries and things. And it took him probably 10 minutes because it was quite a busy time. And they proceeded to negotiate and have a discussion with his wife. And he came back and brought the coffees, he sat down, and they said, right, we sorted, we'll see you in six weeks' time. <laughs> and he said it was the most bizarre negotiation. And the whole premise behind it was that, Marcelo, we vetted you. We know what you bring. We've spoken to coaches. We've spoken to some of your ex-players that you played with. We've spoken to your doctor. We know what we're getting out of you. We know what you can do on the field. We can watch 100,000 videos. But we need to know that your wife, who's moved from Argentina to France and now to England, is going to be happy. And if she's not going to be happy settling in London, then we're not going to be able to, to, get, to make this work. Wow. So the focus was on more than just what the player was bringing to the field. It was about the fact that when he went home every day after training, that his wife would be in a good space and pretty happy with young children. Um, and the focus on those little things. There were initiatives brought in, and it's not new age, but there was a crash that was run at the club on a Tuesday and a Thursday morning, and then a Tuesday, Wednesday, and Thursday morning, where all the players with young kids could bring their, their children in for three hours a morning, and the club financed that. And it's amazing the difference that those small things made. There was a, a little coffee club, for instance, and there's silly examples. A coffee club that was run for partners and wives once a week. Just that they could mingle, that they could get together, that they can um, build relationships outside of what we did on the field. And it was those little things which didn't cost an arm and a leg, but which went so far into a player deciding that he would rather stay at a club and earn less money than go to another club and earn 20% more, but not get treated as well as he was being treated at Saracens. And I think those the, the, the little things, those little um, initiatives that, that went a long way you know, in determining whether a player was happy or not at a club. And, and the challenge is, ultimately, if you're not playing, are you happy? Because we all know, we're all competitive human beings, and if you're a number two scrum half, and you're not getting any love, and you're not getting selected week in and week out, are you still happy to stay at a club that treats you the way they're treating you, or are you going to go and search for another club in search of more game time? Now, there are examples of three or four players who did leave. You had the David Strettles, the Chris Ashtons, um, you had Aaron Morris go to Holocaust because they were frustrated. For one or other reason, Aaron Morris was young, he wasn't getting an opportunity to play, and he wanted to play. And it's not a perfect science. It's not going to work for everyone, and it's not to say that it was perfect all the time, because Saracens, trust me when I say this, went through periods of real difficulty. But I think what stands them apart from, or sets them apart from everyone else is that when they did go through a dip of five weeks or six weeks, I still remember a year we lost five in a row, they found a way out. And I think a lot of that has got to do with everything that was put in place off the field. Because everybody had each other's backs. And yes, we had capable players, we had good coaches, we had great facilities, but so do many other teams. And when they get into a dip, they struggle to find their way out of it. And Saracens have managed time and time again to find their way out of difficult periods. And I think a lot of it, not all of it, a lot of it's got to do with the culture that has been embedded over the last 10 years. Yeah. Now, checking players overseas. Yeah, before I get to that, I read an article on, on the Barcelona Soccer Academy where they, even as young as six or eight, they would identify the six best players, the most skillful, and then they'll drive the culture of the club, whatever that might be, very, very hard, only on those six guys, with the, the idea in mind that when they become the core of the team, that they would carry the, the values. Um, so my question is, do you think that's also part of the secret? I think there's a, bit of, there's a core group of players at Saris that, that came out of their academy that still 
uh, it's still there is that you think that's the key to the longevity of it because it's not easy but it's easier to get a to get the culture right and then four years players leave new players come in new coach yeah I, th I think part of the success is definitely the succession from within policy that Saracens have had over the years um, in terms of the coaches the coaching mm -hmm. in particular um, and, and I don't think necessarily Saracens would rush to bring in an external coach to take over. I think once Mark McCall has run his course, I think you'd probably find the likes of a Joe Shaw or an Alex Anderson or a Kevin Sorrell, whoever it may be, who's been in the system for 10 years to then take the reins because they understand the culture, they understand what works, what doesn't work within that environment. Rather than bring in someone external with a good reputation, and change things completely because ultimately if you're in charge you want to do things the way you want to do them and I think that's a that's a huge risk in bringing in someone external it may be the fact that they might bring someone external like a Steve Borthwick or a Paul Gaston who have been part of the Saracens family for a long time um, with regards to the playing personnel you know and, and the proof is in the pudding you see now with the six British and Irish Lions players who currently play for Saracens who were part of the academy yeah. 10 years ago you know, the yeah. likes of the Owen Farrell, Jamie George, um, the, the McIntyre Polos, and then you had Jackson Rain, Wolf Fraser, mm -hmm. uh, George Cruz. You know, these are all guys who were 18, 17 years old when I first started. And I would like to say, and, and, and it sounds a little bit, um, I suppose, we want to pat ourselves on the back, but they were part of an environment which allowed them to thrive and allowed them to rub shoulders with the guys who were playing at first team level. And that was always the view that Brendan brought in is that those six guys I just spoke of at Barcelona, there were six guys at Saracens and these are the six guys who are now playing British and Irish Lions. And they had the opportunity twice a week to train with the first team and to get a taste of what it was like as a 16, 17 year old to train with fully fledged internationals, the likes of Glenn Jackson's, Justin Marshall's, Charles Burgers, guys like that. And also get treated as equals and not so much as the old school hierarchy where the youngster must polish your boots and pack your bag, you know, and eat at a different table. But it was an environment where there was a lot of collaboration between old and young. And um, listen, it sounds all if airy fairy and great, but there, there were moments, as I mentioned, it wasn't perfect. Um, the difficulty around, I think, identifying young players in rugby particularly is that players mature at different stages. Um, so those six that you that you identified, 16, 17, might not be the six that you're going to be using when they're 22. But I think by the time they get to senior rugby, you've got a pretty good idea. Mm -hmm. and, and I think Saracens have got pretty much that model. They've got a very successful academy, which is quite streamlined. And again, yeah. run by ex-Saracens players, Kevin yeah, Brown, Kevin, yeah. um, Adam Powell, Jamie Tyrrell, and now Mike Heinold is back in the mix. And these are all guys who've served at Saracens for a decade at least each of them, each and every one of them, from juniors all the way through seniors. And again, because it's in their blood and they have a passion for it, they have a love for it, and they're going to do as much as the senior team does and in the same manner. And that idea is, is the blueprint that each team is on, yeah. whether it be a school or club or province or country, is this whole sort of pyramid feeder system where everybody is doing the same and I think Rassi is looking at trying to implement that from a, from a national point of view at the moment mm -hmm. with these super rugby franchises. Mm -hmm. But these things take time and, and it wasn't an overnight success at Saracens at all. It, a lot was down to timing and mm -hmm. probably good fortune and good luck mm -hmm. and, and the right personnel. Mm -hmm. yeah. So obviously uh, the, the way you grow up affects that character that you spoke about earlier as well and being selected for an academy and then being identified to uh, you know, to invest in those specific players because you see them as the people that will shape the team um, further along the road. Um, being uh, or, or the situation is that people come from different backgrounds with all kinds of different childhood experiences and seeing different values. Um, what are the things that you feel growing up helped you deal with the highs and lows of professional rugby? Um, Sure, all these easy questions. <laughs> <laughs> I think mentorship is definitely one of them. Um, and it's... It, it's Who was your, your mentor? So for me, it was my old man. Yes. Yeah, he, was, he was a great mentor for me. And, and he taught me the values that, that I carry with me. 
Um, and, and it was similar values to what was preached to us at Saracen. So for me, it was almost an easy fit. You know, it, it was... Um, and maybe also why you weren't one of the 14 that left. Or exactly, or yeah, and, and potentially that. Um, I, I think mentorship is, is crucial. Um, but, you know, it's, it's not to say that a certain set of values will make you successful or, or they'll necessarily hold you back from being successful because, you know, as I mentioned earlier, there's some average people out there who are extremely successful. You know, but it's it, it determines. I, th I think it depends on what sort of person you want within your environment. And I think, from a coaching perspective in particular, it must be incredibly difficult when you do have that anomaly who is incredibly brilliant at what he does and what he contributes to your team on the field, but he's a bit of a, a handbrake off the field mm -hmm. and he's not necessarily the best guy to have within your environment. And the difficulty that you must have when you know in your heart or in your gut what the right thing is to do, but your head is saying, I can't afford to get rid of this guy. And that's where the strength of leadership comes in. And being able to deal with the maverick and handle the maverick as you have to with the likes of the, the workhorse, you know, who's not necessarily as talented, but he is a brilliant team guy. And trying to explain to him that, Guys, you can't be treated the same because you're completely different. And have the team buy into that. It's difficult because mm -hmm. Saracens had issues at the time as well where certain players are getting treated differently to other players. And it's not a one-size-fits-all, but it can't be. You know, you've got children. I've got three children. I can't treat them the same because yes. they're all different. The one will cry if I treat them the same way as I do the other. The other one will laugh at me. So, <laughs> yeah, and, and that's essentially what it is. And, and I take my hats off to, to the guys, particularly at high-level sport. You know, and how they deal with these with these different personalities. You look like a, a Kevin Peterson, for instance. You know, and, and you get this perception of what he's like. Was he a difficult guy to handle as a team member? Absolutely brilliant on the field, but I imagine he was quite a difficult guy to to handle. And and that's where leadership comes in. And and um, I don't even know what your question was again, but coming back <laughs> to, to the set of values, okay. um, mentorship for me. Yes, was very important. the things that, that, that you learned from uh, in yeah. childhood that you felt helped you. But it's funny that you say that because you do still learn. Yeah, I mean, 2027, 20, 20, 20, 20, 30, 30, And I think what you learn... Sorry, Neil, I, I'm asking that because you said it, it's kind of set yeah. at 18. So I'm yeah. just wondering how... I think it can, I think, I think it can still be molded to certain I think you can learn lessons particularly. Okay. okay. I think, I, I'm, a, I'm a believer and I could be totally wrong in this. Um, you know, I'm no psychologist, but... I think when under pressure and when stressed, I think you revert to type and you revert to what you are mm -hmm. and, and what you know. Um, I think there are valuable lessons to be learned in the journey, particularly in an environment, in a good environment that, you, that you're a part of. You know, one being sacrifice and being able to put the team before yourself. You know, one of the things we've always said that if the team and if the coaching staff don't actually care who gets the credit, can you imagine what we can achieve? You know, and, and it's just simple things like that. If you're not worried about the plaudits and the pat on the back yeah. and you work together, how much more you could probably achieve than worrying about being the one, you know, getting distracted by always and the accolades. Yeah. So and it's things like that that you can learn. So I've I've seen quite a lot of examples, heard heard and read a lot of examples about organizations that stick their values up against the wall and there might be fifty different a four pieces of paper printed out with different catchphrases on it and motivational posters and so on. But at the end of the day, um, the difference between an organization that makes that work as their culture, you know, those values that make up their culture and those that don't, is essentially how the behavior reflects those values. Absolutely. So you mentioned a bit now about players who do their part but they don't necessarily have the, the, the personality to be a team man and then you've got guys who have work ethic but they're not necessarily talented. So what were the behaviors that, that you guys strived for at Saracens that, that essentially made up your culture? You know, how, could you, how could you tell this, this guy is he's living up in Saracens culture and this guy's not? Again, um, sure, difficult to pinpoint, but I think essentially, you know, those behaviours, you know, as mentioned earlier, work ethic was, was a non-negotiable, you know, in terms of what you brought to the party, that 
um, a 90% effort wasn't wasn't going to be good enough and, and you weren't going to be a part of the group. And we actually saw one or two of the players being let go because of that lack of effort. Um, the honesty part and the discipline part, as I mentioned earlier, you know, conducive to group relationships and also to be successful, um, would definitely behaviors really that, that epitomized what we were trying to encapsulate there at Saracens. Treating each other well was incredibly important to everyone at the club. There was never ever a reason. Yes, we push standards to a certain degree and we'd lose our rag and we'd probably swear at each other. And it was always important to pull each other back up when that did happen and say, this is not what we're about. And if I, if I use an example, as I mentioned earlier, Saracens went through dips um, in various years that I was there. And we lost five in a row the one year, we lost three or four in a row, we got knocked out in the quarterfinals of Europe and we didn't get out of the pool stage. And whenever the, there was a problem, and we knew there was a problem, it was never ever about something on field. Because that was the easy fix. It was the easy fix. I can tell you on five different occasions. We sat together as a team and it was never talking about why is our defence so leaky at the moment? Why are we not scoring tries? Why is our kicking game not working? Those are the easy fixes. It was a discussion with 30 or 40 blokes in a room like we're sitting in now saying, what's going on? And it sounds all airy-fairy again. But it was a case of, and it would come out. After 10 minutes, someone would say something, I'm frustrated because I feel like we're not treating each other. And I don't feel like I'm bringing my part because I'm getting crapped on every left, right and centre. And this is not the way we do things around here. And ultimately, that's what got this team up the spiral. It, yes, we looked at the defence and yes, we looked at attack and perhaps it was a strategic thing that Corner is going to. But it was the softer skills and it was those softer things, those off-field issues that needed addressing. And it's easy to just paste those over and say everything's fine. And, and it's hard because, again, it comes down to leadership. And whether it be Mark McCall, who was a much quieter, sort of unassuming leader, as opposed to Brent Fenter, who you know, is your extrovert leader, they're both equally um, good and effective. So um, it would always be the off-field issues that would get us out of that spiral. And it was about trying to determine. But that comes with being together a long time. And that's an important point that we haven't raised, is that successful teams, and you'll know this, you would have studied this, is that successful teams, the Man Uniteds of old, the very Barcelonas, there's a, there's a core group of players that have been together for a long time. They know each other's moves left, right and centre. They know each other's personalities. And I always refer to this as a critical mass. Now, you, you spoke about those certain behaviours and there are certain guys who don't necessarily reflect those behaviours. But as long as there's a critical mass within that 40 strong group of players, and yes, there'll be two or three who fall off the wayside, but if there's a critical mass of positive influences, it'll outweigh the negative. And the negative will eventually pull in line and, and follow. The minute that balance gets distorted, that the negative mass starts to impact that positive mass, then you're in trouble, you know, and, and I suppose it's about keeping a finger on that. But, you know, there's always that old saying of, don't worry, the system will work them out. I don't believe in that. I think that's nonsense. It comes down to leadership again, because only the leader has the power to out someone who doesn't fit into an environment. We can all be players playing together. The five players are not going to kick out one player. I've never seen that happen before. It comes from leadership. Because those five players don't have the power to do it. It's funny, this is actually going to be my next question. So who was responsible for making sure, you know, that that odd one out is sorted out? You know, did the team go to the, to the team management? Yeah, that's it. Uh, it would be exactly that. It would be team management who would ultimately have the final say. Because... You know, you as players, you, you're a co-player, or you're, you're a player alongside another player who you have an opinion of, and ultimately, and, and it sounds like school, but you know, yeah, listen, this didn't happen often, but um, at least we were in a position where we could air it, yeah. and, and you, you could get it out there. You know, so it wasn't discussions that always happened down in the change rooms, yeah. or you know, in the cars on the way home and things like that, because that's the danger. You know, if you're not able to address these things in front of each other, then, then things start to fester. And it's tough because it's, you know, it's, 
there's a lot of egos. It's high level sport and it's incredibly competitive and everybody wants to play. Everybody wants to win. Everybody wants to be in that starting lineup. You know, so and and then a group of forty five players or even more and coaches, you know, you're not necessarily gonna like everyone who you work with. I think it's almost impossible that you're gonna yeah. like everyone that you work with. And you are gonna be at loggerheads with with people and you probably disagree a lot. Um, but there is a way of treating people and I think that's what science has got right over the years. It's amazing how those two two uh, qualities translate to the field where so, for instance, something like a, a kick chase or exit, how you can, in terms of your discipline, uh, just know your role and for the call or uh, what's your job within that call, and then the effort. I mean, if you can, you can see in a, how a team kick chase or defend, or sort of what what's their mentality and how hard they chase. It's even if it's a prop. He'll go full out sprint, um, and he'll and then he'll have the discipline to know what's his role, where does he go to. Um, so it's a power, powerful combination on the field as well. Um, I think there's um, th there was one little award that I think the club still present on Monday mornings, and, and it's amazing what a driver it's been. It's called the TSPDS award. I must excuse my language on this, but it's called the shit people don't see award. And, and the whole thought process behind that is that they see the wing scoring the try in the corner and, and we'll use, well maybe we shouldn't use that as well, I was going to say Greg, but maybe we won't use Greg on the weekend as an example. But, um, <laughs> too soon. Yeah, too soon. <laughs> no, it's it's but, I know it's, it's, I wanted to mention the same example. Yeah, and, and you, you know, you talk about work rate and effort and this TSPDS award, you know, the players, it would be um, getting recognition from your fellow peers and, and a player doesn't look for anything else outside of that. It's all great from, from the press and from everywhere else, but there's nothing more rewarding than having your own group pat you on the back and say, hell of an effort, you know, and what you'd find, with somewhere in the game, it would be a crucial tackle or a turnover that was made by a loose head prop that would result in a great outcome, whether it be a line out five meters from their line or a try or points or whatever the case may be, and he'd get the award on that Monday. You know, everybody would be waiting on Monday to see and it might be a kick chase, seeing a tight head prop chase a kick down the field and actually out sprint one of our centers. You know, and, and it's that sort of effort and attitude that gets rewarded. And it's amazing what it did to the squad that drove them to, to want to win this award, you know, on the Monday and get that recognition from his peers. And you know, the great example on the weekend, that fullback scoring had to be to try. You know, everybody talks about it, what a try, but the resulting tackle that was made or Previous to the, the trapping sport, that Lucia prop that chased back 40 meters, relentlessly never gave up, tackled the poor wrist wing, and ended in the turnover, which resulted in the try. I mean, that was just outstanding, which says a lot about attitude and effort. And that's essentially what Brendan looked at when he first got to the club at training and in matches. How quickly a guy got off the, off the ground when he made a tackle to get back into the defensive line? Was he always offside? Was he disciplined enough to be onside? What was his kick chase like? What would you like getting off the off the line in defence? And it's those little things that that determine a player's attitude in many ways, which was looked at. Hmm. Makes a lot of sense that that you'll uh, measure the attitude in those small things because it's not the things that you uh, you really pay attention to unless it's part of your attitude. Um, I was wondering what what's some of the highlights when you think about think back uh, um, on your career. What what are the things that really stood out stands out for you? Sure, um, I think I was quite happy to play for as long as I did. Firstly, that was quite a highlight. <laughs> I enjoyed that. Um, for me, one highlight, particularly abroad, um, was the fact when, when Saracen started the so called turnaround, um, you know, of, of a squad. You know, we were tipped to be relegated in the first year and we ended up getting to the Premiership final um, where we narrowly lost to Leicester in the last few minutes. I remember that off the restart. Uh, correct. We lost the restart and they scored and they beat us. And we were then touted again in the second year as being a team that was, you know, uh, was a stroke of luck. Nobody expected much, but the second year we, we, we ended up struggling. And we ended up beating Leicester the following year in the final. Also in eight minutes of extra time, you know, and, and for me, that was the, probably one of the most rewarding um, 
experiences that I went through as a rugby player is that not necessarily because you prove people wrong, but because we believed that what we were trying to do was going to work. And, and I think, you know, we went through a stage where we played awful rugby and we played percentage rugby because we weren't at a stage where Saracens is at now with regards to the personnel and the players that they have. We played a very conservative kicking game. We played according to the law, three phase kick, and it was horrible to watch, but it was effective. But what we were doing over those two seasons, we were creating belief and we were making life extremely difficult for opposition. And it was through, I think, the work rate and the attitude that the guys were showing. And with that came belief that we can do this. And then we won that premiership in the second year. For me, that's probably one of the most satisfies, satisfying moments of my career, is that that first premiership win for the club back in 2011, I think it was. Now, is it just... Uh uh, let me make sure you talk a bit of rugby before yes. <laughs> before we let you go. Um, I hear this so many times where, wherever I go, you know, but, um, Fof de Klerk or the Modern Nines, why do they kick so so much? Why do they take so long? Blah, blah, blah. Maybe if you can just give us an insight into, into that world. Why, why would a team look to kick off nine? And why would they slow it down um, in terms of organisational approach or, or yeah. mindset? Listen, it's, uh, I think the strategies are different for different teams and depending on the personnel and the players that you have on the field. But um, yeah, when you've got a, a good kicking arm and you see it in, in most countries is that uh, I just think it's far more effective. You know, you, you're bringing your line up you know, 10 meters further up the field by chasing off nine. Why teams would slow it down, it's, it's to have the correct personnel on their feet. It's about, and we always talk about a nine kicking on his own terms. And he wants to make sure that he is not taking any unnecessary risk to be charged down or to rush the kick and then not have the correct personnel um, in the line or on their feet or protecting him when he kicks at that time. So I know it sometimes might seem a bit lame and a bit frustrating for people watching. And, you know, the execution of the kick might be the reason that it seems like he's kicked the ball away. But there's obviously a clear strategy from every team and it's a bit different for each team is either to put relentless pressure on oppositions in their territory believing that a kicking game can do that by catching them you know in their zones and believing that your kicking game will, will sort of outweigh theirs um, the other one would be to to win back possession so it'd be to kick contestable kicks and to get if you have good wingers up in the air and contesting and having that 50-50 ball on the deck and playing off the back of that. So it's different from Super Rugby to Heineken Cup Rugby to um, International Rugby. You know? and, and I think what you find is the kicking game is far more important at international level as what you find at, at Super Rugby level. Um, and that's down to the fact that you know, the margin for error at international level is just so much smaller. And, and an effective kicking game has been proven with the likes of the island and the Englands of the world. Um, and don't discount the fact that the All Blacks also have a very effective kicking game. People are, you know, perceive the All Blacks to be this all-out running rugby team. And if you look at the stats, you'll see they kick just as much as any other team does. When you say right personnel on the on the ground on your feet, is that yeah. so? You want to play the props, for example, Correct. hit up a pot of two props. Yeah. So yeah. in an ideal world, you don't want your front row or your tight five in the front line chasing a kick downfield. You want your centers, you want your back rowers, and you want your wingers on their feet. If your wingers carry the ball into the ruck and the center is clean and you have another forward in there, you'd rather want to set up another pod with the tight forwards, get them on the deck, get them rucking, and have that wing in that center and that loose forward on their feet that can be in that first line chase. Because it comes back to the point you spoke about earlier, you want a relentless chase upfield, and you want guys who can hit top speeds if you are kicking the ball downfield as opposed to contestable. But you also don't want uh, tight head prop contesting for the ball in the air when you have a winger on his feet instead. I wouldn't mind having that grey prop contesting the ball. <laughs> 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 he was pretty effective. <laughs> uh, part of the reason we do this uh, podcast, Neil, is to, to try and get the knowledge, the wisdom, the experience that guys like yourself have, you know, try and put it out there for the young guys to learn. You know, to, to learn lessons, uh, sometimes hard-earned lessons from players. But um, what, what do you think is the, 
is the one thing, one or two things that you like to give young players out there to remember? Um, if you're talking game specific, obviously I'll limit that to nines. I don't know anything about any other position. <laughs> <laughs> it's, um, for me, it's, yeah, we've spoken a lot about it today, it, it's attitude. Um, and it's, and it's, a, it's a willingness to improve. Um, you know, if I, if I use Owen Farrell as an example, you know, when he was young and he was 17, you know, he just has this innate desire to get better. And I know England talk about it a lot, and sometimes it annoys a lot of us here in South Africa about you know, improving and getting better, and Eddie Jones is a lot about that. But Owen Farrell was a, was a case in point in that you know, he would take every session to get better. Mm -hmm. and, and he'd put in the hours, and not necessarily silly hours, but he would, you know, I think he had more of a mantra, but that's not often, you know, don't ever think that you're the finished product. And he'll still be out there now, prior to the World Cup, probably like mm -hmm. a Johnny Wilkinson was. Yeah. Improving parts of his game where he wasn't strong. It's easy to go and practice the parts that you're pretty good at. So for me, it's great to go and practice uh, passing, because you know, it came naturally. But my one-on-one -on -one defense, or tracking, or defense, or even a ruck, whatever the case may be, it's about encouraging the, the, the young guys to train the areas where they know there's a bit of a deficiency, where they can improve, where there's large areas to improve. Um, yes, keep honing the skills that you're good at, but you've got to work on those areas of your, of your game that, that you probably need to work on a bit more. And then attitude, mm -hmm. as I mentioned, is crucial. Thank you very much. Any other mm -hmm. questions, guys? Sure. I have a million, but um, yeah. You, you um, I, I just wanted to ask. Sorry, on the you you currently sort of in, in a transition into the corporate world, uh, especially of sport, um, for the sake of the conversation. Yeah. Um, how how did how did your transition out of rugby start while you were still busy playing rugby at Saracen? I know I know there's a there's a very good what do they call it corporate soft landing. Program or something? Yeah, with uh, and, Rembro. Yeah, and, and, and I think Saracens in general. Uh, yeah. We there was recently a story about some players, you know, benefiting from a business investment program. Yeah, I think so. You know, Saracens is um, quite forward thinking in that approach. In that, you know, they know what they have in, in um, the employees and, and the players, and, and they're looking at opportunities and trying to help these guys post rugby, you know, and, and get into whether it be corporate world or a little private venture or whatever it case, or coaching for that matter. Um, you know, Kelly Brown and Adam Powell that I mentioned earlier, you know, back into the Saracens coaching system. Um, and, and for me, I was fortunate enough to, to run a Saracens Way workshop, actually, in the last year that I played at Saracens, uh, which looked at leadership development and culture and you know, team environment and personalities and things like that, and telling that Saracens story you know, and, and relating um, the business and the sports world and, and finding those links between, you know, sort of executive committees and, and a high-performing rugby team. And it was quite fascinating, the, you know, the, the, um, the links that, that we would find. And then after that, I, I was fortunate enough to be um, offered almost an internship um, through Rembro's involvement with Saracens, um, you know, a year's program whereby I've jumped around four different companies just to get a taste of you know, the corporate world and, and what is out there, you know, and, and currently based here at Stellenbosch Academy of Sport, working alongside the likes of Corner S and, and looking at one or two other little programs and initiatives we were looking to launch here. So it's it's by no means easy. I've been very fortunate that I've, I've had a, a softer landing. Um, and and I, I must say that I can imagine how difficult it must be when you don't have that. You know, and it's a big issue. And, and I know you, you work closely with guys who, who do retire and guys who weren't fortunate enough to play as long as I did. And, and the difficulty in going from playing to, to the real world, so to speak, is, is finding out exactly what it is that you have a passion for outside of rugby. Because ultimately a lot of guys who played rugby started when they were student age. Mm -hmm. We never really worked a day in our lives, you know, and, and that's the reality. And um, we know we have the right, well, I'd like to think we have most of the right qualities to be successful in some way, shape or form in terms of your work ethic and your, your discipline and your honesty and the values that you've always carried alongside you know, with you with the rugby. But it's still about finding that, that thing that, that drives you and gets you up in the morning. So, 
And it's again, I think it comes down to mentorship and it comes down to using people that you've, not using, but bouncing ideas off people that are willing to help. And, and that's where personal development and Saracens have a great program running there, which looks at individuals and what their interests may be and where they may lie post career. And they yeah. start working on that while they still play. And they actually have to continue working, Correct. even if it's not in rugby. You're not going to have opportunities coming your way just because you're famous. Exactly. You know, and you work that out very quickly. And, and some are far less famous than others, you know, myself included. And what you realize when you finish playing, <laughs> you, you are quickly forgotten. Yeah. You know, and, and that's the reality of, of this world that we live in. Um, you know, and there's very few guys, there's a, there's a, a very small niche crew whose um, profiles can carry them on for 20 years. Yeah. Yeah. But you're talking about a percent of a percent in the rugby world. Yeah. And, and it's great for them, but there's another, I mean, a thousand rugby players in South Africa who will retire at some or other stage who nobody really knows what they've achieved, even though they might have played in a province for 10 or 12 or 15 years. Yeah. And it's about making that transition out of the rugby. And it's, it's difficult. And Kyle Brown and myself have been speaking about ways and means in which yeah, this transition could be helped. You know, for a lot of players, another PRA in England has looked at it. You know, my players over here are looking at it, and it's I don't know what the solution is. You know, but again, it's it's got to come from the player themselves as well. But it's difficult to explain to a twenty-two year old that this is going to be very important. Try nineteen not even worse. <laughs> <laughs> I was nineteen. We were all nineteen once. Yeah. You know, so, at least you were studying in nineteen. Yeah. But it's great to have guys like you that are trying to push this agenda and get the guys to realise it. You know, it's especially in this day and age because you know you see the bright lights and and the big contracts that are being offered. And it's easy just to forego everything else and, and chase the stream. And I've got no issue with that as long as there is a plan B if the stream doesn't materialize. Mm -hmm. And I'll be telling my son the same thing. Mm -hmm. You know, so he's got dreams of playing for Tottenham Hotspur. So <laughs> I'm going to have to manage that. <laughs> you obviously I'm hoping he gets it right. You are obviously in England for way, yeah, way too long. Fingers no. crossed. Then. <laughs> <laughs> My pension. <laughs> awesome. Thanks, Neil. Cool. Thanks, Neil. Thank you very much. Appreciate the time. Thanks, Neil. Cool. Yes. Cool. Awesome. Au revoir. Au revoir. Thank you. 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 What's this idea? It's a shame you didn't check your WhatsApp while you were busy. Yeah. You're a master. It's funny you see this.